Thank you for listening to the Bayina Institute podcast. Please join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Bayina Institute, or you can join our email list at http bayina.com and share these recordings with your family and friends. Inna alhamdulillah, alladhi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu, wa nukminu bihi wa natawakkalu alayhi. ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إنما التوبة على الله للذين يعملون السوء بجهالة ثم يتوبون من قريب فأولئك يتوب الله عليهم وكان الله عليما حكيما وليست التوبة للذين يعملون السيئات حتى إذا حضر أحدهم الموت قال إني تبت الآن ولا الذين يموتون وهم كفار أولئك أعتدنا لهم عذابا أليما اللهم لا تجعلنا منهم رب شح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر واللهم اجعلنا من التائبين أمين يا رب العالمين In today's brief khutbah I'd like to share with you a very important and probably much repeated subject matter that is discussed a lot in the Book of Allah and also in the beautiful traditions of the Prophet ﷺ. And the subject matter is that of repentance and asking for forgiveness and turning back to Allah, the Arabic word being tawbah. It occurs many, many places in the Qur'an. And I'd like to start with one particular uh, recognition and acknowledgement that no human being is above the need to make tawbah. None of us. None of us are in a position that we don't need to ask Allah for forgiveness or turn, to, turn back to Allah for our shortcomings. If the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that he makes istighfar to Allah, he asks Allah to forgive him 70 times or more every single day, then that leaves us in no position to think that we are ever going to be above the need to ask Allah for forgiveness. The thing of it is, you would wonder, somebody, a person might wonder, why would the Messenger of Allah ask for forgiveness? Obviously, forgiveness is asked for when you do something wrong. Why is it that Ibrahim salam says, وَتُبْ alayna? He just built the house of Allah. Allah just told him he's imam over all of humanity. He graduated him basically. And then part of his du'as, he says, وَتُبْ alayna? Accept our repentance. What's he repenting for? It's a really important question to ask. This is an acknowledgement by the great prophets alayhim salatu wassalam including our messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam that there are shortcomings that you, you remember, that you know that you did something wrong and there are all these mistakes that you have no way of knowing. Allah you, knows you and me better than we know ourselves. Even in the good deeds that you and I do, there are shortcomings. I don't know if I did a great job or not. You and I are gonna stand in a few minutes and we're gonna stand and make salat. And at the end of the Salat, you and I might feel like, okay, we accomplished our goal. Salatul Jum'ah, the right of Salat has been accomplished, we did it. But what the angel wrote down in each of our records, we don't know. We don't know what grade we got on this Salat. How much khushur did we have? How much did we pay attention? How sincere was our prayer? How much were we thinking about what's for lunch? Or that project at work? Or whatever else? So on the outside, it looks like all of us prayed. We were facing the same direction. We were standing up in line. We fulfilled all the formalities of prayer. But on the inside, the quality of those deeds are also being written down, not just the quantity of them, right? 
And we don't know where those stand. So when the things we don't know, we ask Allah Azza wa Jalla apologies for on top of the things that we do know we did wrong. So there's a combination of both of those things. For the messengers alayhi wasalatu wasalam, imagine the messenger of Allah himself sallallahu alayhi wasalam, who's going to do more service to Allah Azza wa Jalla as a slave of Allah than our messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. But even he's worried all the time, maybe I'm not doing enough. Maybe what I'm doing isn't good enough. I have to ask Allah's apology for not doing the best I possibly can, I'm worried. And, the, and Allah Azza wa Jalla in the Qur'an constantly keeps consoling the messenger, no, no, you're doing enough. You're doing enough, I'm, I'm pleased with you. <laughs> you know, you, you don't have to worry. But the messenger is never satisfied and he continues. He continues to make istighfar to Allah. The reason I brought this up is so none of us think, including myself, just because I'm up here on a mimbar talking to all of you, doesn't mean that this is something you need and I don't. I need istighfar as much as anybody else. Every one of us is in need of this asking, begging Allah to forgive. So let's take a little bit of a, a, a basic walkthrough of the process that each of us kind of has to go through. Some things that we all have to acknowledge before we can effectively ask Allah Azza wa Jal for forgiveness. And in that light, I, eventually I'd like to share two ayat with you that belong to Surah An-Nisa. Before I tell you about the ayat though, just a little bit of background. And that is that these ayat are early Madani period. When the Prophet ﷺ had moved to Medina, and one of the earlier surahs revealed the early formulation of a Muslim community, the regulations for those Muslims were revealed in Surah An-Nisa. So we find the inheritance law being revealed in Surah An-Nisa, some social laws being revealed, interactions between men and women, you know, the, the discipline between men and women, and the crime of shamelessness, etc. is discussed at length. Some of these sins are mentioned, some big sins like zina are mentioned, and right after that, these are ayat about tawbah. These are ayat about asking for forgiveness. In other words, Allah has certain expectations of you. If you haven't met them yet, you need to be making tawbah. But I'll come back to those ayat. I want to go take a different direction for a couple of minutes. Listen, when a per all of us sin, there's no way around that. There, all of us sin. We either sin directly, in other words, we do things Allah doesn't want us to do. We look at things we shouldn't be looking at. We entertain ourselves in ways that aren't appropriate for us, that aren't suitable for a Muslim. We waste our time in things that we shouldn't be wasting our time in. We earn money sometimes in questionable ways. Muslims, we earn, we, we get into business practices, or we get into financial transactions that we know are questionable, but we get into them anyway because we say it's a tough economy, what are we gonna do? We have to feed our family or whatever. We come up with excuses justified to ourselves and do them. Whether it's business transactions, oh, and by the way, it's not just that, we deal with our family members in an unfair fashion sometimes. We get into conflicts with our wives, our children, our brother, our cousins. We get into unfair disputes about inheritance. We do all kinds of things that are wrong. And our daily lives even, we utter things, we lose our temper quickly, we use foul language, words come out of our mouth, we backbite against each other, we lie, we make little white lies, we think it's not a big deal. You know, your boss calls you, you're on the way to work, right? Your boss calls you and you're like, oh no, I'm, I'm right there, I'm right by the building. You're not by the building, you're like 10 miles away, but you gotta tell your boss a little bit of a lie, you know? And we don't think that's a big deal. So if a person really sat down and started thinking about all the sins they've done, at least the ones they can think of. Remember I told you in the beginning of this khutbah, there's a whole bunch we can't even think of that we've done. There's a whole bunch that Allah knows more than us where we fell short. And that's just the bad deeds. That's not even counting all of our mistakes in our good deeds. In other words, like I said, salat, dua, something simple like wudu. How many shortcomings were there in our wudu? How many shortcomings were there in our salat? How, many, how much were we really paying attention in when we were asking dua to Allah? It reminds me of a famous story I mention all the time. Ali radiallahu anhu was passing by a guy, he was making istighfar. He was just asking Allah to forgive, right? So he was saying, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. And he was just writing it out, like reciting it. And he looked at him and he goes, your istighfar needs istighfar. You know, the way you're asking Allah to forgive, what is that? You're just reciting words, parroting them without knowing what they mean. You don't even look like you mean it. You're just fulfilling an exercise. That's not what istighfar is supposed to be. You're genuinely supposed to be sorry for what you've done. So what I, the, the first main point I want to make to you guys is, man, we do a lot of bad stuff. We, we make a lot of mistakes. The angel on the left side is really busy. He's got a lot to document. And when a person really starts thinking about that for themselves, 
two things immediately happen. I don't know what, how that happened. But <laughs> two things immediately happen. One of those things is that you become overwhelmed. You feel like, I am so ruined. There is no way I'm going to get into Jannah. With all the stuff I'm doing wrong, there's no hope for me whatsoever. That's one of the things that happens. And that's not a good thing necessarily. We'll talk about that in a bit. But another thing that happens that is kind of good is that you stop worrying about other people so much. You know when you're so worried about what the other person is doing wrong? And you're so concerned about their mistakes and their sins and this brother does this and that sister said that and they did this. You know what that's an indication of? You're completely not worried about yourself and you're so free from that that now you have time to worry about somebody else. That's what that means. In other words, you, haven't, you and I haven't given enough thought to our own sins and our own shortcomings for us to get really concerned with the nitty gritty mistakes of everybody around us. That's what that means. So if you, really, you and I really started thinking about our sins, we'd le worry less about what other people are doing, we'd become more primarily concerned with what we ourselves are doing. Now, if you really do get concerned with you, what you yourself are doing, and you get overwhelmed that there's no hope for me, there's no forgiveness for me. It is at that point that we need the, the, the guidance of Allah Azza wa Jalla. There's a very hopeless, depressing state to be in. You know, the, the, the most difficult or the most dangerous psychological state is to be hopeless. That's the most dangerous psychological state. You know, non-Muslims even, when they completely lose hope, they do things like overdose on drugs, commit suicide, commit all kinds of crime, when they're hopeless, when there's no hope for them. They, they're willing to do all kinds of things. When they reach that absolute bottom in the soul of a human being, that is when a human being has no hope whatsoever. But Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't leave us hopeless. The Messenger of Allah told us وسلم, from the very beginning, كُلُّ بَنِي آدَمْ خَطَّعُونَ All children of Adam make mistakes. Well, at least now we know that that's something even the Messenger acknowledged وسلم. But he added, وَخَيْرُ الْخَطَّعِينَ تَوَّابُونَ The best of those who make mistakes are people who come back to Allah. They turn back and repent to Allah. In other words, Allah has left that door open for us. No matter how many mistakes we make, Allah is willing to wipe the slate clean. No record. You know in any society, once you commit a crime, it goes on your permanent record. It can't be expunged. It can't be removed. It's there. It's sitting there. It's like this dark cloud over you. You know? People that, for example, have been inside the system for whatever reason, when they come out, they have a very hard time finding work. People do a background check, they can't get a job. Because there's something on their record. Allah Azza wa Jal completely wipes out your record. If you and I are sincerely ready to turn back to Him, if we really mean it, if we really, really mean it, it's not words that Allah is looking for, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's looking for a sincere heart that turns back to Him. A heart that truly feels sorry for what He has done, or what she has done. When we can do that, Allah offers us a fresh start. An absolutely fresh start. These are the words of hope that Allah Azza wa Jal gives us in Surah Al-Furqan. He goes a really extreme step. He doesn't just say that He'll forgive our sins. He says, فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ Those people that truly repent back to Allah, I will take all of their mountains of evil deeds and convert them to good. In other words, just for you sincerely turning back to Allah, now it's not just that you have to answer Allah for a million evil deeds, he converted those million evil deeds into a million good deeds you haven't even done. Just because you made tawbah. Just because of that. Just because of that one thing he's asking from us. How much more easier can Allah Azza wa Jal make our life? You know people that do a lot of sin, shaitan comes to them and tells them, you're going to hell anyway, might as well party. That's what he tells them, literally. And they, and they live it up like that. Well, pff, what am I going to do? You don't know brother, I'm real messed up, so might as well go all out. Listen to every single whisper of shaitan. Might as well go out with a bang, right? Only live once, and then you burn forever. That's the idea. You know, congratulations on that, that mentality. What does Allah Azza wa Jal tell us? إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمَ رَبُّكْ وَلِذَٰلِكَ خَلَقَهُ مَا يَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابِكُمْ Allah says, what's Allah gonna do punishing you? Think Allah wants to punish you? Allah asked that question in the Qur'an, He asks us that question. What's He gonna do punishing you? 
That's not why He made you. In another place He says, the only, except for the people He showed mercy to, and that's why He created them. He created them so He can show them mercy. He created us so we could earn His mercy. He didn't say He created us for hell. He created us so we could earn His mercy. He wants us, He wants to show us His mercy. He opened the door for us. He asked us to take one step and He'll fill in the rest Himself. You don't even have to do more than that. Just turn back to Him a little bit. Give Him a little. And He's willing to open those doors. So now with that introduction, I want to share with you these two ayat of Surah An-Nisa that I found absolutely remarkable on this subject. And to prepare you for these ayat, one last bit of intro. And that is a homework assignment for myself and for all of you today. Usually you don't get a homework assignment in a khutbah. But here's one for you. I want you to take a piece of paper when you go home tonight and write down what your perfect day would look like. If the angel came to you tonight to take your soul, if the angel of death came to me tonight to take my soul, and I had the exact day that I should have had as a Muslim, that at least that day I can say I died the death of a Muslim. I died a righteous death. I died a good death. What would that day look like? What time would I wake up? What would I say to my wife and my kids? What time would I pray and where would I pray? Then I probably I'd go to work. But how would I behave at work? How would I talk to the secretary? Where would my eyes be? What, what would I check on the computer? How honest would I be with my employer? How would that day look like? If I knew the angels coming that night, what would that perfect day as a Muslim look like? I, it doesn't have to be a day that's, you know, beyond your capability. It's just a good day where you did what you're required to do, and you stayed away from things you're supposed to stay away from. It's not that complicated. But if you can make a detailed schedule for yourself, every one of you is different, I'm different. If you can make a detailed schedule for yourself, in which you made yourself a perfect day, and of course, the most important part of that day is the pillars of that day. You know the thing that holds up a building is the pillars, right? And the thing that holds up our day is the five pillars, the five salawat, the five prayers. So that part of your schedule is already perfect, you gotta make sure that's there. What do you do in between though? What do you do in between? إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ كَانَتْ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ كِتَابًا مَوْقُوتًا Once you can have that, that's something you and I should work towards. This is what I can accomplish. This is what my day should look like. How come it doesn't look like that? Why do I wake up so late? Maybe it's because I go to sleep so late. Why do I go to sleep so late? Maybe because I've been watching movies until 12 o'clock at night. Maybe I need to cut down on that and go to sleep on time. Why is it that I can't, I never feel like crying when I make dua? Maybe I haven't even gone to Allah's house to visit Him, feel closer to Him for a while. Only time I show up to the masjid is Jumu'ah. And even that almost at the time when it's over, so as soon as it's over, I can run back to life again. Why is it that every time I make salat, I go into sajda, I can't wait to get out? Like, Subhana Rabbi al Azim, Subhana Rabbi al Ala, immediately, like, it's like, even saying that, I have to say it fast forward. I, I can't stay there that, that long. I got stuff to do. I got important things to finish, you know? What's more important than putting your head down before Allah Azza wa Jal? I don't understand. What, how can we convince ourselves of that? The one thing Allah asked Iblis to do, <laughs> the one thing He refused to do, and He asks us to do it every day, and we, if we do it, it's like, a, it's like a joke, it's like a hit and run. That's not even, a, what is that? That's sajda? This is, so you make that schedule for your day. Now listen to these ayat. إِنَّمَا التَّوْبَةُ عَلَى اللَّهِ Tawbah is only mandated upon Allah. Allah is saying the word إِنَّمَا كَلِمَةَ الْحَصْرِ فِي هَذِي الْآيَةِ مَذَا تَعْنِي What does this word mean? It means what Allah is about to say is an exclusive agreement. It only applies to certain people. It's not for everybody. It is only for the people that are about to be described. He says, عَلَى اللَّهِ Allah, nothing is mandatory on Allah. Nothing is mandatory on Allah, except the things Allah makes mandatory on Himself. He says, Allah, it is mandated upon Allah to accept tawbah for certain people. Allah has made it compulsory on Himself to accept the rep repentance of certain kinds of people. Who are these people? <laughs> for the people who do sin, now I'm roughly translating here for the people who do sin. Allah just said, He made it absolutely mandatory on Himself to forgive the people who do 
sin, but he goes further. Let's understand who these people are. And before we do, a little bit of an attention to the word يَعْمَلُونَ as opposed to يَفْعَلُونَ يَفْعَلُونَ In Arabic, there are two words for doing something. يَصْنَعُونَ also. There's all these words for doing something. يَعْمَلُونَ means you have the intention. It's not like some mistake happened. You did it, you knew what you were doing, and you made a mistake. There's one thing to, you know, end up saying something that you didn't realize was a mistake. That's unintentional. This is intentional stuff. It's not just a mistake. The first step in tawbah is you and I have to at least admit that we've done something wrong and stop hiding behind excuses. al ma'adiru makadir. The excuses are lies, that's all they are. If you can't even be honest to yourself and say, yes, I made a mistake. I was wrong, no excuses. You know, I can't hide behind anything else. I know you can't hear me, I'll try to speak loudly, inshallah. I can't hide behind my excuses. Move up as much as you can, please. You know, every time we make a mistake, we, shaitan comes down and says, no, no, it's not your fault, it's society. You were under a lot of pressure. You were really angry at the time. It's your friend's fault. It's this one's fault. They made you do it. He made you do it. This is why it happened. It was really hot that day. It was really cold. Oh my God, you'll come up with a bunch of excuses. And the last thing you will do is admit that you've done something wrong. The first step in turning back to Allah is you and I honestly have to accept that we've done something wrong. And that's humiliating. You know why people make excuses? Because it's embarrassing to admit that you made a mistake. It's embarrassing. And when you can embarrass yourself in front of Allah, that is proof that you no longer have any pride in you in front of Allah. Allah wants humility from you and me. He doesn't want to see our pride. He doesn't want to see our ego. He doesn't want to see even this much of kibar. Mithqala habbat, mithqala habbat min al kibar. Not this much. He doesn't want to see that pride in us. So admitting our mistakes get rid of our pride. That's what it gets rid of. So we, we admit our mistake to Allah Azza wa openly. And once we do, Allah adds bi jahalatin. He didn't just say ya'maluna su'a. He said bi jahalatin. But let's look, pay attention to the word su. The word he used for sin. You know, there's dhamb in Arabic, there's janah in Arabic, all, all these words for sins. Su comes from saw'a. Saw'a means a corpse. Nobody likes to look at a dead body, a corpse, lying there on the, like an animal corpse on the highway, or a human corpse, something. It's disturbing. It's something ugly. It's not something you want to look at. Allah Azza wa compares sins to that ugliness. That's what He does. It smells. It looks disgusting. It's deteriorating. He compares. That's the word, that's the origin of the word su. Sayyi'at, it comes from that word. So you've done something ugly. Admit it. But then Allah gives the reason, bi jahalatin. This person did this sin because they were overwhelmed in emotion. Jahala is an important word in the Arabic language and in the Quran. It means to be overwhelmed emotionally. You got really angry and you did something you shouldn't have done. You got really tempted, you did something you shouldn't have done. You got really greedy and you did something you shouldn't have done. You got really excited and you did something you shouldn't have done. That's when people do things they're not supposed to, when they get excited, when they get overwhelmed by an emotion. Whether that emotion is fear or anger or greed or jealousy or lust or temptation or whatever else. But they get emo moved by that emotion and they do something wrong. Allah says, yes, those emotions are there. And this person did commit a sin. Then soon after they turn back to Allah and say, Ya Allah, I did it. I know I did it. I'm a human being. I know I made myself a perfect day. And I was working towards accomplishing that perfect day. But I made a mistake along the way. I got overwhelmed and I made this mistake. I'm turning back to you. I promise I will not go back to this again. Ya Allah, I'm humiliated for what I've done. You're having now a conversation with Allah Azza wa Jal. You don't have to have that conversation in Arabic, by the way. You can have that conversation in your language. Allah Azza wa Jal is the, is, the, is the teacher of all languages. You and I turn back to Allah and basically admit to Him what we've done. فَأُولَٰئِكَ يَتُوبُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ Those are the people whose repentance Allah accepts. Those are the people who Allah is willing to open His doors for Him. Your, th those doors are not closed for you. You're not beyond hope. And uh, let me add something here before I go to the next ayah which completes this subject. Without the next ayah, the subject isn't complete. But something really important. Don't think of yourself like other people think of you. Don't, don't judge yourself like other people judge you. Other people might think you're awesome. That doesn't mean you're awesome. That does not mean that. People used to come to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu and used to say, you're so great. 
And he used to say, Allahumma a'atini bima yaqulun. Wala tu akhirni bima la ya'alamun. He used to say, Allah, give me as though what they're saying is true. <laughs> and don't grab me over the things that they have no idea about. They have no idea. He knew himself. He didn't let himself get deluded by what other people say about him. Also, don't judge yourself over the negative things people say about you. You're so evil, you're so corrupt, you're a munafiq, you're a hypocrite, you're a liar, you're a cheat, you're a scumbag, you're gonna go to hell, etc, 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 etc. None of that means anything. People don't know you, Allah does. And if people say you're definitely a loser, you'll never be a good person, etc, etc, that does not mean that Allah's judgment is that on you. Just like people's praise does not mean you're a good person. People's condemnation does not mean you're an evil person. That is up to Allah to decide, nobody else. That is between you and Allah. Don't let people's comments about you influence your relationship with Allah. That is, they didn't get that information from Allah before they passed judgment on you. They, didn't, they don't have, a, have that information. Only He does. He says, وَلَيْسَتِ tawbah." While He tells us, these are the only people I accept repentance for. May Allah make all of us from them. Then the next ayah says, here are the people who I do not accept their repentance. Just so you're clear, I want you to be the people of repentance. Here are the only people who I'll accept. Here are the people I will not accept. لَيْسَتِ tawbah." لِلَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ سَيِّئَاتِ for the people who keep doing sins over and over and over again. Last ayah, the word used was su, mufrad, singular. Now we find sayyiat, plural. In other words, this guy just keeps doing on sins. He goes, oh, astaghfirullah, I shouldn't have done that. Well, I guess I'm gonna do it tomorrow and say astaghfirullah all over again. They're not addicted to their sin. They don't keep doing it over and over again. And keep telling them in the sun, well, at least the door of Tawbah is open, I can play with that a little. You know, the, 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 what we used to think is a Christian mentality. I'll just go on Sunday and ask for forgiveness. Then I got a whole week to party. You know, then I'll go back on Sunday and clean the slate again. That's not how it works in our religion. Allah made sure you don't play with His deen like that. So He says, for people who keep doing sins, and then keep going back, knowing that they'll just ask for forgiveness, it's okay. And they'll move on, it's not acceptable. You don't get to play games like that with Allah Azza wa Jal. لَيْسَتِ التَّوْبَةُ لِلَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ سَيِّئَاتِ until finally death comes to one of him. He goes, ah, I mean it this time. I'm done. No more for me. You know, one time I was flying, and I usually when I fly, I, I fall asleep. And I was flying, and you know, you look around you, there's people watching movies on their iPod, or their iPad, or the laptop, or playing cards, or whatever, listening to music, bopping their head in the plane, you know. And I wake up and the plane has dropped like 50 feet. So the cabin pressure changes. The, the cups of malakul mouth drop. You know? What do you see people doing all around you? Everybody's praying. Everybody's, oh God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Everybody's doing it. Every, doesn't matter what religion, they're all doing it. And then the captain apologizes, the cups go back up, the flight's back to stable again, and guess what happens? Hit the play button, bro, I was in the middle of a really great scene. You go back to, my, to normal. This is playing games with Allah Azza wa Jalla. Until death comes, he goes, Oh, I'm all sorry, 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 sorry. Inni tubtul an. Neither those who die in a state of disbelief. In other words, people who play around with tawbah and people who die as kuffar, as disbelievers to Allah, it's the same. He put them the same way. Same ayah. He judged them the same way. I will not accept the repentance of people who die disbelievers. I will not accept the repentance of those who keep doing it over and over again and think it's a game. They keep repeating it. Just because they know they can get away with it. It's not gonna happen. Those are the people I've prepared a painful punishment for. Our attitude towards Allah. Step one, at least admit what you've done wrong. Step two, turn back to Allah and ask Him to help you get out of that sin. And He will. You cannot say, the sin is more powerful than I am. Because Allah says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah does not burden any person more than they can handle. You could handle it, that's why you are made a human being. You are great, you are more powerful than your sin. Allah Azza wa Jal knows that. So you can't lie to yourself. Lying to yourself will not get you off the hook. I don't care what sin you're involved in, you are more powerful than it is. That's what Allah did for you and me. He honored us. If He didn't honor us, our sins would be more powerful than us. 
Shaitan would be more powerful than us. Inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan. My slaves, you will have no authority over them. Allah told Shaitan, you will have no authority over them. The, the source of all evil, Shaitan, has no authority on the human being. So we have no reason to make excuses. You admit your sin. You and I turn back to Allah and acknowledge that we've made a mistake. You sincerely promise Allah that you will stay away from it. You sincerely promise Allah you'll stay away from it. You'll do everything in your power to change that about your life, to get away from that sin. Whether that comes from bad friends, or it comes from you being home alone on your computer, or it comes from your friends in college, whatever that comes from, you will make the efforts to change that about your life. That is tawbah. Whether it's your tawbah of being lazy, you always wake up way after Fajr, and then you're like, oh, might as well just make it up. And it's become a joke to you. You don't take it seriously. And you say, I can't help myself. Yes, you can. Stop watching movies at night and wake up early and stand in front of Allah. Stop making excuses. Stop kidding yourselves. Allah Azza wa Jal will lift this nation when we become a nation of tawbah. When we become cleansed by His tawbah. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us all sincere in asking Allah for forgiveness. May Allah Azza wa Jal accept our repentance and make us better and better Muslims as the days go by. May Allah Azza wa Jal help us lead, uh, lead and raise strong, healthy Muslim families that are able to share the beauty of this religion with all of humanity. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim.